I'm very aware <laughs> that uh, I'm going to be welcoming um, Ed and Emma on to, to talk to you here, but uh, and but we're not the only banner makers in the room, and uh, there's a lot of uh, banner makers here. In fact, put your hand up if you've made a banner. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah. you see, I thought so. That's that's most obvious. So um, this will be a, a very much a sharing, not a telling, I think. Uh, and um, we'll 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 we sort of welcome insights and contributions from the floor as well afterwards. So that's the plan. We're going to start. I'm going to do a, a very sort of quick whistle-stop sort of primary school tour of where banners come from. I mean, a lot of this and, and, and the history of banners. And Ed and Emma are going to chip in with any knowledge they have or any corrections they might have to, to what I say. Um, but, and, and likewise from the floor. But I just thought it might be a nice idea if we're all sort of, if we all sort of know where we're coming from, really. Um, I shall show you some slides here, if I can get this to... Ha <coughs> ha! Yeah, this isn't a banner, because this doesn't exist anymore. That there is Edward III. Um, Banners have been around for millennia and obviously predating him. But I found this wonderful reference to Edward III, who in Christmas 1341 ordered a dozen giant red banners to hang around Windsor Castle that says, with the, 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 the sort of enigmatic slogan of, it is as it is. And mm. modern historians still have got no idea what he meant <laughs> by that slogan. <laughs> <laughs> it obviously meant something to old Edward. <laughs> <laughs> it is and it is, and don't ask any questions. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm king, you're not. <laughs> but Edward III was so passionate about banners and flags and clothing that half of his expenditure went on textiles. Um, uh, which is which is incredible. Really. Better than armies. And armies. Mm. Mm. Yeah. I just said better than us. Oh right. Better than on clothes than on yeah. arms and fighting. Yeah. But he did that too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Big style. <laughs> Big style. Yes. Um, so the skills around uh, banner making uh, in medieval England and the, the, the skills were abound. All of that textiles stuff was around. Um, England's always been internationally renowned for cloth and uh, wool at, at, at the period, and Opus Anglicanum, very, very fine embroidery, which was internationally renowned. Um, the amount of textiles that was used even in the military and the jousting, um, uh, and banners were really important to the military because at a time before uniforms, how else were you to know that the person in front of you wasn't a was a friend, wasn't a friend and not a foe, as you wield your uh, battle axe at them. Um, visual communications using banners have played an enormous part through history. Um, they were used as shop signs. It, again, these just don't survive anymore, a bit like pub signs today. Um, they went on to be used extensively by the trade guilds, um, which leads us on to that sort of it starts that proge pro progression through to unions, really. Mm. I'm going to jump forward a little bit to the late 18th and 19th century, when the guilds and the unions were illegal. Um, mm. But they met in private. Um, remnants of this still exist. The Masons, which is now seen as perhaps part of the establishment or not necessarily a radical organisation, um, was incredibly subversive in its day. You know, think of the funny handshakes and the, um, the, the secret signs and the secret societies which are still there today. They have an enormous tradition of banners. Um, mm -hmm. Most of these are hidden away in lodges 
throughout, um, throughout the country. Mm -hmm. uh, some of them are absolutely fantastic. Uh, mm -hmm. But they, they, they do exist and, they're still, and it's still a tradition which continues today. They're still being made. Um, who made them? Hmm? Who made them? Um, traditionally, they would have been made by those big banner making companies like <laughs> Tootle and things, people like that. Yeah. Um, early protest banners, I mean these weren't protest banners, um, are somewhat ephemeral as, as, as banners can be and they don't survive. Um, there's only one of the Peterloo Massacre banners which has miraculously survived but there must have been hundreds on the day mm -hmm. that we will never know or remember. Um, uh, similarly, uh, church banners don't survive because um, they rotted away in dank churches um, and later Victorians were the first to throw away any old musty old textile um, and they just, just weren't, pres weren't, weren't preserved. Um, the church is important. Um, the church is very important in terms of banners. Uh, in 1821, school children processed across the country to commemorate the coronation of George the Fourth, um, and it was this this procession that evolved into that tradition of wet walks, mm -hmm. which is still really big around here. Mm -hmm. These are two pictures of a wet walk in Burnley at the top, and a much more modern wet walk in Paddiham. Um, you know, yeah, it's, so it still happens. They so did, uh, they did very elaborate Sunday school banners, uh, yes. which were in the traditional style. There's one on quite large, and I've been lucky enough to see a few original ones of those. Um, but they would have been uh, on the top on there, so uh, with the with the children in white, very much like that. But the Sunday school banner. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, it's it, that's that's really important um, because quite often the the. You know, the, the, the mothers' unions, the WIs, the Sunday schools of Lancashire, of South Wales, of the Midlands, of the North East, etc., um, were, the, were often the radical, non conformist rebel rousers of their day. You know, we don't think of the WI and the mothers' union as being particularly radical, but certainly the mothers' union was there to fight for political change. Um, uh, and, and, and that's where those Sunday schools, so that, that sort of radicalness of the church is really, really important. Um, so, in 1825, um, trade unions were made, or the concept of trade associations were made legal again, and that's when the banner came out from that, in that context. The iconography was often religious um, and depicted the workers as heroic classical figures, um, something that the, in, in Durham a lot of that, that tradition has been restored or re re retained. Um, and often use a lot of symbols which we might associate with people like the Masons and things like that. Here we have the, the all-seeing eye is a Masonic symbol. Those, those symbols and the, the, the clasping hands are something, iconography, which is continued as a tradition. And it's all sort of appropriated as well because yeah. the all-seeing eye in the uh, large banners is used for the uh, symbol for cooperation and sort of the... So it is a use whatever you like type of thing. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Interesting. And also here, we, we, before the First World War, people were much more tuned into the symbolism of things. Um, here is the language of flowers. Um, all the flowers meant different things. Um, the, uh, and geogra geographically as well, for some strange reason, this area of northeast Lancashire, as it was then, was represented by the cornflower. Now it is, seems a bizarre flower because there's not many cornflowers growing in northeast Lancashire. So <laughs> <laughs> <Or> many cornfields. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, but you know, the, the, this sort of symbolism was very much in people's uh, consciousness, along with the symbolism of, of, of colours. Interesting stuff, and that's large. All of this is largely lost on a modern audience. Um, and, and, and like I was saying, you know, sometimes that people see that all-seeing eye and they've no idea what it, where it comes from. 
But there is a there is a bar in Burnley called the Illuminati that has it as its symbol. Yes. <laughs> um, okay, so um, any union worth its salt um, wasn't going to make do with a homemade banner. Um, and companies such as George Tootle and London and Henry Waite and Company in Manchester, plus many, many others, uh, started springing up. One of the consequences of this is that they sort of very much codified how a banner should be, if you see what I mean. So there was, there was a tendency for a lot of the trade union banners produced um, b before the 20s to be you know, to, to have a have a sort of standard layout, shall we say, um, and, and, and that's very much recognised. Tootle invented the concept of two painted silk banners put back to back mm -hmm. to make one banner uh, oh, with the oil. Hmm? I'm going to contradict. Please do that. Yeah. Uh, I've been lucky enough to paint on some of the original turtle silks. It's actually one piece of silk, ah. uh, jacquard weaves, so that on one side it will be blue and silver, so blue being the primary colour, and on the other side it will be silver and blue with silver as the primary colour. Right. But banners that we paint are always on one piece of silk, yeah. and so it's a mirror image. Yeah. And with the turtle, uh, the circle uh, was woven mm. in, as was the top scroll. So that and would be plain, right. and so it was just that which was painted. Right, oh, yeah. I see. So, so, yeah, the scroll was actually woven into the fabric. It's all woven into the fabric and then it's painted on top. On top. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. That's great. Um, I mean, it, um, you know, banners following these formats are still being produced today. I mean, Jamie Holman's exhibition in Blackburn, if any of you have been to see it yet, um, you know, you will recognise this, this concept. I mean, the, the likes of Mr. Tootle and Mr. Waite also made church banners, they also made Masonic banners, they also made military banners. It was big business. You know, and capitalism orange banners as well. Hmm? And orange banners. And orange banners, yes, yeah. of course. Mm -hmm. Of course. Yes, I've missed out orange banners, that's a really good, really good point. Yeah. Um, these banners are largely identifiers. They're, um, they're the banners that you have a to say, we belong to this particular branch of this particular union or this particular organisation, and that they're not necessarily, um, uh, not necessarily aligned to a single issue, shall we say, that, that, that you've invested a lot of money in them, you only going to use them for years, you don't want them to say no to Brexit. <laughs> Um, excuse the spelling mistake on the next slide. I did notice it before, but I could only do read only on here. So, <laughs> um, <laughs> I do apologise. Um, so, the cooperative women's movement and the suffragettes were very largely responsible for sort of redomesticating the banner um, and focusing the banner on issues. Um, fashions also changed, so the arts and crafts movement. Uh, took the aesthetic away from the Gothic scrolls and uh, some of the, the iconography from earlier times. Um, so when women came to the fore in banner making, the aesthetics changed. The techniques changed. Piecing, applique and embroidery that could be done at home and was done in the home and picked up and put down between other, other jobs um, could use using scraps and affordable music uh, sorry, uh, affordable materials, um, the, 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 the importance of all those domestic singer sewing machines that were flooding into the country at the beginning of the 19th century are, you know, is not to be underestimated. Um, and so this is the subversive stitch, really. Um, just to move on quickly, we can follow through to the 1970s and the community arts tradition, there are a number of examples in the, um, in the exhibition where you know, a group have done a square each and they've been sewn together to make that cooperative, collaborative banner. Uh, and and that's, that's really important. Um, we mustn't also forget the 
the the importance of the <laughs> of the sheet, the bed sheet, and the <coughs> the night before the. These don't survive because they're not seen as precious at the time, and I think that's a real shame. <laughs> but at the same time, we do have some photos like, like this. Um, one of the great things about this exhibition, I think, is that you can look around and see all of these influences and traditions uh, still, still coming through in various different forms, um, and they're still alive today. So if you go back to the exhibition after this, I encourage you to have a game of influence bingo <laughs> to see what you can see uh, just moving forward where is the tradition going um, I don't know exciting th exciting times my wife Sue reminded me that uh, about what led by donkeys are doing um, has anybody not, any, everybody come across led by donkeys um, they're taking a subversive message and projecting it using light but it's still performing a lot of the, on, onto buildings or the White Cliffs of Dover. Um, got an example of them getting the to work. Um, <laughs> that was probably only projected on Buckingham Palace for five minutes while they took the photo. <laughs> How wonderful. <laughs> and I don't know if her match was in. <laughs> <laughs> so that's just a very sort of brief look at, uh, at, at, at where some of, some of these banners come from. Um, I don't want to steal the show, but I'm just going to spend a couple of minutes just explaining why I'm here before you hear the main speakers, because they're the, they're the really important people. So uh, we can come back on to that. So this is me. And as Nick said, I've been working on the Youth Universal Protest Project. Um, I'm currently a co-director of an arts company in um, Blackpool called Culturepedia. We're cultural producers and project managers. Um, I'm here because in a past life I was a professional banner maker myself. Um, I studied embroidered textiles in Birmingham. And I was the artist in residence at the National Life Sethford way back in 1992. Oh, I haven't changed that. <laughs> <laughs> which, which, which was great. And um, I was making banners and I was even picketed by Talia Campbell, um, which is a story I can tell you uh, privately about. Um, <laughs> I went on to work for Bannerworks uh, Cooperative in Huddersfield making community and trade union banners. We were a regularly funded um, organisation of what was then called Yorkshire and Humberside Arts, and part of the Arts Council, so. Good old Arts Council funding banners, fantastic. <laughs> We'd, I've not got many photos back from the early 90s when I was making banners. I've got a few here which I can just sort of flick through just to give you some clues and some of the... That's a very specific and local <laughs> trade union, that one. <laughs> I think it's from Halifax. <laughs> mm -hmm. These are really bad photos. This is a double-sided banner. I think the Sheffield NUT didn't like the fact that the logo had been changed, so they wanted mm -hmm. the old logo on, <laughs> on the back. Um, oh. T&G's women. When you're, when you're appliquing banners, banners, God, how much you learn to hate the unison language. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or painting it. Or painting it. <laughs> Try the N-E-A-U. No. Uh, that is so painting. It's never going, never going to touch that one. <laughs> Just something else that I, I found that I've produced from those days. Um, so I've been somewhere else for 20 years, producing, administrating, uh, managing, and I've just strayed back into banners occasionally um, with projects such as the Blackburn People's Choir banner, which is in the exhibition, uh, which made in 2000, but that's because I was a member of the choir, and you know, that was, that was for that reason. Um, back in March, uh, I went on the People's Boat March in London, um, it was less of a march, more of a 
stand still with a million other people because mm -hmm. there's too many people to march. Um, I made two banners uh, for my wife Sue and myself. Um, they were much admired. Uh, mm. There were very few textile banners in evidence on the march. Most people carry homemade placards mm. or, or printed placards by the People's Vote Organisation. They were sort of mm. giving them out. Um, but I make no criticism of that. Um, the sentiment was great and the sense of immediacy of those protest banners was, was fantastic and energising. Some were of great quality, um, some weren't. It was tremendous work. My favourite one said, um, let's be very British about this, apologise and never mention it again. <laughs> <laughs> I was struck by the amount of slogans and phrases that could equally have been used on much smaller pro-Brexit march the following week, or by any other march for that matter. Um, with this in mind, I decided to create a series of uh, crafted banners um, with the words and slogans that could be taken on any protest march, but I'm, uh, I'm leaving down with this sort of thing to Father's head. I'm not doing that one. Uh, most textile banners, apart from those hastily painted on an old sheet the night before, as I said before, are identifiers, you know, that we belong to this particular group. Um, so my banners, in a sense, are more akin to the protest um, placards, um, but embracing the tradition of the traditionally sewn banners too. Um, I chose to seek design inspiration from historical banners, <laughs> from a more contemporary aesthetic, um, I've also paid close attention to the mechanics. Um, I think things like poles are really important because they're mm. the skeletons of the banners. Mm. Um, they give them a structure and a third dimension. Um, and the sleeves and cords and turreted hanging tabs and mm. tapes are also very important. Um, personally, I've always been drawn to text. Um, we're conditioned to read. Um, we are taught how to absorb and process text in a way that we're no longer taught to read images. Um, that symbolism I was talking about before, I think. Um, the, uh, you know, sometimes six words on a banner can convey a meaning far quicker than a painting. Um, very few of the placards that are used in nowadays include imagery, um, allegory or symbolic meaning. Um, Despite it being the area of Instagram, we still respond to text, I think. Piecing, plique, provide texture in a third dimension. It's important to me that they are well crafted. I do my best. And hang well. Um, the, in homage to the cardboard placards, some of the banners have shadows of commonly found um, packaging on the rear. Um, each piece is individual and should ultimately work on its own, but I initially envisaged it to be more like a, a collection and an installation, um, presented as if they were on a march without the people. Um, in a sense, I'm a little bit of a fraud with these because these are more of a, a, an art installation rather than genuine protest banners, which a lot of the ones in the exhibition are. Mm. So I apologize for that. Still a work in progress. Um, eight banners have been completed to date. The collection is growing, number nine is in production, but I'm also quite inspired this week by something that Kath found in America, which is the library of banners, library of protest banners. Mm -hmm. See, in Chicago, was it? Yeah. yeah, so you can go along and, well, I'm going on a march next week, can I borrow a banner? <laughs> <laughs> which I think is a great idea. <laughs> So they you never know. I hear lots of stories of banners being lost. Always, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, apparently the Blackburn Labour Party banner is constantly being lost and then eventually found behind a bar somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm that's enough of me. I'm now, now going to ask um, uh, Emma, if, if, if you would do your, your presentation. So this is a tattle silk, if uh, you haven't ever seen one. So uh, Jack art woven 
as I was saying, it's always two tones. So on the other side, red is your primary colour, and then mm. there's sort of silvery red mm. is your primary colour. This central round or exactly like this, is plain. And so that was the area that was painted, and the top, top uh, scroll work is plain as well. So. Mm -hmm. And they don't exist. There's none in existence anymore. Uh, we're lucky enough to find nine of them, which had been folded up in an old warehouse, left in a corner, covered in oil stains, coffee stains. They were over 60 years old. Nobody knows how they're going to last, of course, because we're talking about silk fibers that haven't been properly taken care of. Uh, so a lot of the banners that we painted on uh, are already in the traditional places, uh, breaking around the round door and at the top, especially. I always think that the traditional banners had a, a sort of a built-in lifespan. I think Tatu was very, very careful to make sure that where they had things like that top scroll met. You see how just at the base there, we've got that little triangle going up. When you think about the friction that's created between your silk and the painted area, especially with a lead primer, mm -hmm. so obviously they're going to rip. So I think they, well, as much as a banner is meant to last forever, I think that there actually was, hmm, okay, well, you know, we've still got to make a quid here. Built in obsolescence. Built in obsolescence, yeah. exactly. Um, I, uh, my husband and I took over the business from my parents in about 2012. Um, my mum was a community arts worker, did a lot of work uh, during the miners' strike with the miners' wives, and also uh, was a banner maker campaigning. Banners in the 70s and 80s, primarily working with the peace movement and anti-apartheid. Uh, she was asked to do her first replica banner um, in the 1990s, and my father had just retired, and he joined forces, and they started Durham Banner Makers. And we've been going on and off ever since. My husband and I uh, have been very busy since we took over, and we're always surprised that people want a traditional banner. Um, I just thought, because I know I was going to talk a lot about trade union banners, so I thought I'd stick with uh, the launch banners, which is um, part of what we do. So, uh, Durham Miners Association was the second largest trade union in the UK. So, why do we still want replica banners um, is a question which people often ask, especially HLF when people are looking for funding because uh, exactly what is it going to bring to your community? We don't have any working mines anymore in the county. What's it, you know, really, why do you need this? And as Rob was saying, the, one of the things about a banner is it's a collective force, it brings people together, it's an icon, whether it's words or images, we gather. And there's such a disparity in communities, especially in the Northeast, I'm sure we have it here in Lancashire as well, where communities are more and more fractured. And so we've got communities in Durham working hard to raise money to get a traditional banner made, and they'll do it in all sorts of ways. Um, one person Fiona met the other day, Jackie, I've got Jackie's banner here. They raise funding for their banners through all sorts of different ways. Um, even a, a boy who kept chickens would donate his egg money. And they would do this for about six, seven years, slowly, slowly, slowly getting money to make a banner. The banner remains in the community as soon as we finished it. It doesn't have anything to do with us at all anymore. It's completely community owned. So there's a very different sense, even though you're making a traditional artwork, there's a very different sense of ownership as an artist that you get when you make a banner, which you do for community banners, trade union banners, and even the large traditional silk banners. It's, you work with a community to create something for them, and then you let it go. It's no longer part of you. And its lifespan after that is completely dictated by how many coffee stains get onto the banner and how many stories you create. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, if none of you have been, I'm just going to put a few plugs in as I'm speaking, if none of you have ever been to Miners Gala, largest trade union event that we have, I'm pretty sure in the world, We've got over 200,000 people on the streets. Uh, it, it's absolutely a phenomenal display of community spirit, of socialism, of an engagement and a collaboration of politics, art and music that you will not find anywhere in the world. It's absolutely incredible. And I don't just say that because I make some fans. <laughs> um, so this is a quote, Norman Emery works at the Cathedral and he's done a book which I highly recommend if you've got any interest in Durham Caulfield banners. 
Balance of the Miners Battle Standards, proclaiming graphic messages of hope, calls for ju social justice, recording more vividly <coughs> than any other art form the history of the struggle of working class rights. And I think that you can apply that pretty much to any banner, mm -hmm. really. But there is something about the traditional lodge banners. When you think about the time that it takes and the how important it was, each member, you know, each miner gave a due to go towards that banner. And there used to be each year, who's got the biggest banner? Yeah. Who's going to carry the biggest banner? And how many have donated and made this, this incredible thing that they have possible? <coughs> uh, this is one that we just did this last year. The DMA was 150 years this year. And as part of uh, their ongoing commitment to keeping Miners Gunner alive. We have an organization called the Maras. Please, 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 second plug. Go on, become a friend. Uh, it's something which we need to keep alive. It's such an important event. And they go all over, they work in schools, they do talks, uh, community gatherings, and really try to spread this message of even though the industry is no longer a part of who we are, it's still essential that we don't forget the history and where we come from. Um, the, excuse me, the, the Maras organisation, yep. uh, which I, I, I contribute a small amount each month, entirely forms the Blue Miners Garden now. The Blue Miners yep. Association is completely run out of funds. It has no income, it has no members anymore. Mm -hmm. The last bit in the Durham Coalfield closed in uh, 1993. So it's entirely dependent on the Maras organisation to yep. keep that gala going. So I can't stress how important it is for people to give, even if it's two or three pounds a month or yep. a five or a month. Uh, there are thousands of people involved in it, but the gala depends entirely on them. So I do support your call to urge people to join the Maras. Thank you. Um, so, Durham Coalfield Lodge Banners, this is one that we did, and I've chosen this one to show because um, it's one of my favourites that we've done, uh, because just this community was exceptional. This is a woman uh, who managed to convince a little boy to give his egg money away. <laughs> and when you think about it, as much as you know, this sort of repetition of seeing dead men on banners becomes a bit tedious, I think, visually, but there is just something about the fact this photo was taken early in the morning on Miners Gala. They, the community will take their banner and go out prior to Miners Gala, and they'll walk through the village. And they'll have their photo taken with the banner there in the village. And quite often it will be blessed by the local priest or somebody who will give a little speech about it. And you just think about these people, you know, 1950s. The importance of this day was absolutely phenomenal. It was, you know, you think about everybody, uh, anything you can think about how horrendous it would be to go underneath the earth, to work, to mine. You come above soil, you know, come above, Tunneling away, you come above and and you have still this sense of bonding and collective social identity, which part of what the Maras is doing is trying to make sure that that still continues. So we're no longer a group of men who are who are toiling, but we're many many voices and many many different identities within our communities now. But we could each sit in front of a banner like this, and we could make up a fantastic new banner representing how diverse our communities are today. But I, I, I don't know, I love this. Very basic, our silks, um, we struggle incredibly hard to find because we no longer are producers of exceptional quality white silks in the UK. Uh, I find that whenever I find one, it disappears very quickly. Uh, it's no longer being produced. So I go to New York every year and I buy silk. I go to uh, Paris, I get some silks in Boston, wherever I can go to find high quality, it has to be very strong, it's got to have a dense structure so it can support the weight of the paint. Um, it's an ongoing battle, as are poles. <laughs> ah. uh, here's another one, again just this idea of unity, so we've got the, the naval man, we've got the miner, 
And then often uh, iconography, there's, uh, I mean, you went in, the one about the flowers, I have to have, you have to email me. Yeah. Uh, color is also tremendously important, traditional green, reds and golds. Um, and then also a lot of them will use, um, this is a replica, obviously, uh, that they had of um, Harold Wilson. And he is a bit contentious. But, you know, I don't know. The communities want to still have the banner as it was when they first commissioned it. So we have Harold Wilson on one side, and on the other side, what we quite often do is we work with a small banner committee to develop a new side for their banner, which represents the community as it is today. Uh, what else do we have? So this is an example here of a new side. So mm -hmm. you have to imagine uh, County Durham is not a, the city itself is very wealthy, we have a huge university, we have the cathedral, but the outlying villages, you can take a bus from the east of Durham and go to the middle and the life expectancy when you start to when you get off is 10 years. Mm. So in East Durham the life expectancy is 10 years less than it is. We have a high rate of um, teenage suicide, we have uh, massive health issues. The communities themselves don't have a lot. Mm. That, you know, they don't have a lot to hold on to. And one thing that Urbana does is it brings diverse members of community and new community members together to take ownership of their village and to think about where is it that we want to take the spirit of our community in the future. They want something which is lasting, and quite often for us that means that we end up doing sort of, you know, boring things like the community centre, but again, you have to remember, they've struggled maybe for 10 years to get funding and to go through all of the loopholes to apply for a small community centre for, for themselves. So we may look at it and think, oh, that's a bit dull. And they always still want a very traditional format, so we do, you know, the traditional scroll work, the decoration, um, and then sh a shield of some <laughs> sorts, could be oval, sometimes a square. Um, but we follow a very traditional format because that's what our communities that we work with want. Um, I did a little bit about Tuttle, uh, because he, it really is quite fascinating, but the, the, this whole sort of decoration, came uh, from the fairground carnies who had the, you know, they would paint mm. the uh, merry-go-rounds. And so uh, Tuttle, uh, George Tuttle did that himself when he first started off, and then he was approached by a trade union to paint his first silk banner. Uh, factory was destroyed in the blitz. I would like to, if I can make it happen, show you a very short film about a different, might get Rob to do this, about a different banner company. Squares, yeah. arts, and paintings cover a wide field, yet few people associate them with the little group of men and women who are perhaps the most distinguished and talented craftsmen of all. So now at the Kitchen Hartfordshire Studio office of Herbert Sharp, let's take a look at banner painting. <laughs> the specially woven silk banners are painted in oils and decorated with gold or silver leaf. A delicate sounding combination, yet they are not merely showpieces. Such is the quality of the village works of art that in fairly regular ceremonial processions up and down the country and abroad, come rain or shine, the banners emerge immaculate as ever. Small wonder that each one takes about four months to complete. The team of brilliant artists led by Mr. Sharp turn out between 100 and 120 banners a year, often with religious or political. Since 1837, and Banner Street in the city of London was named after it. 
and it still exists. So this is an orange banner, King William. to get back to my PowerPoint, which might... It's here somewhere. Could you control all the There we go. Oh, you can. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, just... Uh, ooh, try and get this large again, sorry. There we are. Um, so quite often what will happen is uh, we're given a fragment uh, for banner. So this is the Trenton Colliery Lodge banner. And so we, we, this one was particularly difficult because uh, the person who owned the banner had actually, maybe 50 years ago, uh, they uh, cut it so that it would fit above the fireplace. Uh, so all that remained of it was actually this and a very small piece on the back. And so we did a lot of research. We knew that this was an interpretation of the Good Samaritan, and we did a lot of research to find uh, who did it originally. And we actually found that it was a painter called Sir Charles Eastlake, and he did it for the royal family. It's part of their co collection uh, with a white horse, which is very unusual, because usually it's a donkey or a grey horse. Mm. Uh, so there's always a lot of... Um, there's always a lot of research which you have to do the background to a banner. Um, quite often, the original banners were painted. They just uh, the lodge would look through a catalogue. It would have uh, several several different images that you could choose from, but you wouldn't have the opportunity, for instance, of putting the exact pit of your uh, of your place in. So one thing that we do now when we do replica banners is we make sure that the actual pit wheel or the village is, is recognizable. Um, so even though we do a replica, we do a few tweaks, modify slightly. Um, so Trim and Corey banner, uh, I wanted to put my husband in there because he's a massive part. It's him and I, it's only the two of us who have the business and he's never here. It's always me. He doesn't like speaking in public. Uh, but Edgar actually grew up in Albania and uh, studied fine art from a very, very young age, as it was in communist Albania at the time. Um, so he studied social realism from the age of about nothing. Uh, so he is the ideal person to be painting banners, in particular something like this. <laughs> uh, so I'll swiftly just do a few... Uh, I'm going to go very quickly here because I've gone way over. Um, we, we do banners for all sorts of different um, events and people, communities. So this was for the uh, National Communist Party. Uh, this is um, Anna Scargill and Betty Cook, Daughters of Mother Jones. Amazing, amazing organization. I encourage every single person to look up Daughters of Mother Jones. We all know the song, She's Been Coming Around the Mountain. Mm -hmm. That is about Mother Jones. Any time there was a strike, you would see Mother Jones with hundreds of people leading them on their way. So please do uh, look her up. She's phenomenal. As are these two women who are amazing. Mm -hmm. uh, we work a lot for trade unions, um, still doing the traditional painting. Uh, so yeah, this is, I love this one. Uh, <laughs> Kehani, I don't know how many times we've painted him. Uh, and we also do a load of work with schools. Um, we like to encourage schools to make sure that the banners that they inherit are a learning tool, not just something that they have for a couple of years, but something they can use for a long, long time. So, uh, And then, of course, we work with Jamie Holman for the British Textile. You know? Uh, so if you go to Church Street, you'll see three of our banners there, which Jamie um, designed and are based on the amazing research he's done about the textile industry here, about acid house, raves, about shoes, about cowboys. So uh, again, please, please, please go visit Church Street and the dark satanic mills full of joy. 
Mm -hmm. um, I've got uh, I've got some business guys with me, but if you just look up durbanamakers.co.uk, you'll see masses more about what we do. Mm. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. yes. Now I feel. Thank you very much for coming and listening to us. Um, and I feel a bit humble actually, seeing the exhibition and knowing that many of you make banners. I mean, we're a very um, elite group, I think. And, we, you know, <laughs> and I'm so glad we're all in the same room. And, uh, it's they, they are marvelous, and they get amazing exposure. I mean, you look at the six o'clock news at any time, you know, they're all on the TV, on, they're, they're, they're sort of a hidden kind of um, art form, really, with enormous exposure, and that's what I quite like about them. Um, I'm going to mention, through the, my talk, um, the French Napoleon, the French Revolution, because I think, for me, that is sort of part of the tradition we're in. There was a time particularly in Lancashire, you know, we're talking about Peterloo and those kind of things, when the, the ideas of equality were going to be exported from France and imported into Britain. And I think that's, that's part of the tradition that I think I'm working in and I love working in. Um, so I'll mention that a few times and I don't apologise for that, and especially because of these stupid political knots we're in at the moment. You know, we should be international, you know. But, I mean, this is, I live in London, and this is in, across the Thames from me, George Tootill's house in um, Upton Lane in East London. So if we all work hard making our bands, we end up <laughs> <laughs> capitalism. <laughs> And from what I understand, he didn't name the same piece painters, did he, in the, who worked for him? And he didn't allow them to join trade unions. I mean, that's, that's my understanding. So he was a good old boss, you know. And, but the, the reason I'm mentioning it is because I'm making a banner at the moment for, uh, in honour of Walter Tull, who was the first um, black, as far as we know, the first black professional footballer in Britain, who ended up um, playing for Tottenham Hotspur and... And that will be unveiled in this building, so it would be a, I, I just can't believe the thrill that I'll be unveiling a banner, you know, 130 years after George Tilti left his house. So that, that's, um, then the, I can't praise, yeah, the next one please. I mean, I can't praise enough the um, People's History Museum. <laughs> and this is a rotten photograph, but there's a, they've got an exhibition on at the moment, which is absolutely brilliant, and it just, it goes all, it is a terrible photograph of Miss Mine, so I'm sorry, but it, it, and I come from, I live not far from Greenwich, so you know, I live in Greenwich, not, you know, walk to the um, Royal Hospital, so, but it, it, they have, the People's History Museum, if, if that wasn't there, and I know they were praying for Andy Burnham to get elected as Mayor of Manchester, you know, because... <laughs> But if it, if it wasn't there, then it would be a, such a loss for people to see the imagery of the left and the trade unions, and it's so important and so well. The other thing that interests me on this is, um, you know, that a lot of banners this period on a Cardinal Manning, who's, who was instrumental in solving the dock strike, the great dock strike, and, uh, you know, it seems... I think it's partly to do with may maybe, you know, Catholicism moving into Britain with the need for labour and... Um, but he would, these religious figures were extremely powerful figures in that time. And, you know, obviously times have changed and... Um, that's that. And the next one, please. And I, what, what I'm trying to do is to go through some of the work I've done this year and hopefully this whole thing that fascinates me about... History, is it important? Culture, is it important? You know, is it, what is the future? Is, you know, and I, I just sort of think, and hopefully this talk and these slides will sort of try and demonstrate that there is a kind of, in the sort of banner making and the contacts people make, mm -hmm. then the, the, the future is in the kind of, the, the work itself kind of thing. Mm -hmm. This is Elsa James on the left, who's an Essex artist. 
and um, she approached me. She's a she's very conscious um, of black people living in Essex because it you know a rough time they had ha, have had and maybe um, still have and the the sort of Anglo-Saxon roots of Essex. So she decided to make the Essex flag, which is three sea axes, three swords, in a completely black flag, and then she would have that as part of an exhibition. The other interesting thing she found out, there were more witches um, hanged in Essex than any other part, any other county in Britain. And that, I knew I was coming to Penhall, so, uh, <laughs> so uh, that interests me. I mean, obviously, it was a ferocious, Religious, but I mean, particularly in Pendle, when the government of James I chose to inflict this kind of Puritan uniformity on, or Anglican uniformity on, on a potentially Catholic part of the country, Lancashire. And it's wholly, as far as I'm concerned, politically motivated and victimised entirely innocent people. And I think that's what um, Elsa is trying to sort of, you know, make base with. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's the, that's the flag, it's the, it's the Essex flag in black, you know, yeah. and, and, see, and then she hopes to have it in, um, paraded through the Tilbury um, dock terminal where the Windrush had landed and mm -hmm. um, have it exhibited um, as part of her, her art endeavours. Thank you. And then this is, um, I mean, this is my sort of stock in trade, really. It's a, um, the one I finished quite recently, and I try and make them extremely simple. Um, you know, um, rather as Emma was saying, I try and personalise, and this is the General Secretary of the UCU, <laughs> who, when she's on a picket line, she has a leopard skin coat and, um, you know, they drink champagne at 10 o'clock every morning on the picket line. <laughs> so, so it's, you know, I try and, you know, make references um, for the people I'm making them for. <coughs> and then these, these are exhibited in the exhibition, which I'm so proud mm. about. And the earlier part of this year, I was making these for the um, National Trust at Quarry Bank. And um, I, I went, they, they come out of workshops from schools and I tried very hard to incorporate the, you know, not sort of, it's very easy to be a dictator, but you try and listen to what people are saying and include the, the, the ideas that they had. And um, it, this was Neil Green, which was a secondary school. And they were interested in the order of society, so they've got banks and, you know, they were quite happy to talk about banks and the police because they thought they were very supportive of the, them and they also were extremely interested in food and um, <laughs> <laughs> those kind of things. And, but that, I, I, and to, I mean, to meet young people and work in these situations, it, you know, God, they're so enjoyable. But, yeah. <coughs> And then this was this is quite this was the one from Quarry Bank, which was the archivist banner, and that's Quarry Bank Mill, which is not as grand as this one, but <laughs> and they all the children who mainly worked the mill were in that apprentice house at the top. But the other thing I really wanted to get into was, of course, all the cotton that was woven in um, Lancashire um, came from plantations in the Carolinas, and I wanted the. This is sort of a, you know, I really wanted the National Trust to get involved. Even, I would have paid myself, to, you know, to go out to the Carolinas, because I know there are heritage sites like this, um, which are slave plantations put in aspect and tourists can visit them. But I mean, I have included the slave revolt, and there were plenty, um, and an African village to, you know, to try and link the two. But I would have, if the, if, if the National Trust had given me more of a head, I think I would have explored far, far more of that whole subject. Because people were working in terrible conditions in Lancashire, but it was far worse in the Carolinas. <laughs> yeah. 
And then at the, at the end, when the four were made, um, they were paraded through the grounds of the National Trust, with, and they had a fortunate, it was a beautiful day in March, and you know, that, that, that there was a march through the grounds, which was really good. And then this, this, a lot of my work is to do with, this was to do with refugees in London who don't have any real status. Their appeals have gone sour, they are not deported, and they're just in limbo land, really, um, living. And they collaborated um, in this um, banner. And they, I mean, all the draw, I mean, the letters are mine, but all the drawings are theirs. And um, that, that, you know, mainly from Croatia and Nigeria and African villages, and um, the, the, the Turks and Kurds were in the same sort of group working, and they've got these. I mean, we don't know. I don't know about them, but they have these very famous singers um, singing um, Turkish and Kurdish songs, and um, that, that, that you know that they were all they all met up at the. Institute of Contemporary Arts, which because they gave us the property to um, work in, and then they um, at the end of it we stuck all the bits together and made this banner. And then this this is the banner I made, but this lady who's not not a refugee, but she was making these earrings. <laughs> So I, that, that made me think, really, well, banners are one thing, but you can, you know, political protest and art, you know, you can do the same with earrings. <laughs> now, I mean, this is a typical example of what I do, and I hope you, I mean, being indulgent, but this young lady is an art student. So she produced this painting of the Toll Puddle Martyrs. And um, the father, who's very proud of his daughter and her achievements, insisted that I put her image on the GMB Toll Puddle banner. You know. So, and I met up with them, and don't try and argue with a proud father, because it's... You know. <laughs> but it, so I had that job, and, and then hopefully the next one will be what happened to it. <laughs> And that's the, that's, the, that's the image of the Toll Puddle Martyrs with the Dorchester Courthouse, the figures that she did in this sort of constructivist art deco sort of style, and then they paraded it through Toll Puddle. <laughs> And then this, oh, I can't believe this, but Jennifer Reed, who's a famous singer, is in the audience. <laughs> And this was um, a woman's war at, at um, an exhibition in Barnsley, which linked in with um, Truth to Power, which an, a playwright, Jeremy Goldstein, did. And um, the, 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 my reference to the French Revolution, Jennifer sings a song um, in honour of the guillotine, and it was written um, intending to act to advocate the beheading of George III and because bread prices were rocketing in the same way as they had in Paris and people thought the guillotine would be a fantastic solution to it all. <laughs> and um, I'll, I'll, I know Jennifer's here, but I'll read her the song she sings. And it's, long live great guillotine which shaves off heads so clean. Wonderful thing. And, that, and, that, and you're, and you, and you're for, sorry Jennifer. Like the rich people walking past the pub would be like, isn't that great? The lower orders are singing the national anthem. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. And I mean, that is the national anthem and the words were actually written um, from the battles against the Scots just before the, the whole revolutionary period. So it fits in so brilliantly. And um, I, I love that complete disrespect um, for authority and the monarchy. You know, and I think we ought to get a bit more of that. <laughs> and then, the, uh, if there are any musicians here, I want them to identify this. <laughs> and 
Shall I play it on the piano? <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I'm very, very fortunate because it, um, about 20 years ago I met the artist Jeremy Deller who... It, yes, yes, yes. <laughs> Yeah, very high. <laughs> 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 yeah, I mean, oh, I, I, mean, oh, I can't believe it. But the... <laughs> but the I, I was incredibly fortunate to meet Jeremy Della, the artist, and quite honestly, if you had to put the top ten artists of the world, he'd be in that top ten, I'm absolutely sure. I mean, his work is phenomenal. But this was a, an exhibition, he's, which is currently in Graz in Austria, and it deals with the far right um, in Austria, which has got a worse problem than perhaps we have. But the, the, this was the possibly the greatest music ever written and Nigel Farage stood up and turned his back on it, you know, in the European Parliament and I, I, I was so happy, to, so happy to make the, make the banner, you know, with the ode to joy. Mm -hmm. And this was an, the same exhibition, you know, we, um, we, we, we are, every country has its own fascism meme, and that was, that was part of it. Because I, I'd love, when I meet Jeremy, I say, why don't we, you know, I'll paint a big demonstration with Tommy Robinson in it or whatever. And no, 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 I just want the writing well done. <laughs> <laughs> no. No. Excuse me. I am sorry, I am sorry. <laughs> And this is another one. They, I, they, I got mixed up with the Edinburgh Festival this year with um, four, um, <coughs> well, they're not girls, they're writers, you know, who um, had very successful shows at the Edinburgh Festival and they needed something <coughs> to sort of sell the tickets, so they paraded down Princess Street with this to try and sell the tickets. <laughs> And this, I mean, I, I, I had to include this because climate is the issue now, and I've made this for um, militant sort of musicians who, who've taken this out on climate debt, and that's the songbird, you know. There won't be songbirds if it carries on like this. So. And then this was, I got this for two reasons. One is I made a banner of when they were attempting, well, it's very extremely successful, to save Preston bus station, which is the most unbelievable 60s building, which was, um, they said it cost £17 million to restore it, so the, the leader of Preston Council said, well, we'll demolish it in that case, and it, and it, 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 it was saved, and anyone who's seen it, it, it just takes your breath away. It must be one of the most stunning buildings in Europe. And it, they've got an exhibition about it at the moment. But the only the thing that it interests me, there's a frieze in the Harris Museum in Preston, and perhaps we've all seen it, yeah. which was um, to do with um, Alexander the Great's entry into Babylon. And, and it had been put there, or it was originally done, to celebrate Napoleon's entrance into Rome. Now, he never actually visited Rome, and, but they'd made this huge, great... <laughs> Freeze for the Quirinal Palace. They made copies. It was in the Great Exhibition. That was 1851, so you know, not that long after the Napoleonic Wars. It was, you know, still, we were still happy to exhibit things like that in Britain, which makes is interesting. They gave copies of it to um, selected museums, and one of them was the Harris Museum in Preston. And it always interests me, we've got this astonishing thing when Napoleon was tramping all over Europe and he thought he was exporting these grand values. And we've got it in a major kind of British gallery. And I, I just wonder if, we, if people know what we're, what we're doing, you know. <laughs> And this, uh, this is Peter Lou, which is big, obviously, this year, and I made that for the um, rail workers of Manchester. And um, that, I, you know, that, that is history, and it's had a lot of exposure, and, um, 
you know, Orator Hunt and all these people, you know, they've become, they, there were more women on the platform than men apparently, you know, and they, more women killed in the charge, but, mm -hmm. and Shelley wrote this wonderful poem and, you know, that, that, that's deep, deep in the culture. And then it, that was when I heard on the radio that Bob Crow had died. I was just—I mean, I knew him, and um, you ought to, his speeches were just unbelievable. They were so littered with inaccuracies and grammatical. <laughs> 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 and yet, I, if you wanted, if you made a banner about Bob Crow, I'd correct the English. And they always used to say to me, "No, don't correct it. We want it as Bob says it." You know? <laughs> and but he—he he was when the books are written. He won't be listed as a trade union leader. He'll be listed as a great person, I think. What's the flag at the bottom of that? Well, no, that's Cuba, because he Cuba. was very anxious to promote Cuba. And Millwall Football Club, I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> no, because I lived near Charlton. And whenever he met me, he, he used to say to me, why aren't you supporting Millwall? <laughs> and he'd say the same to you. Well, you know, I don't support Millwall. And <laughs> yeah, this is um, t this year with, um, I think it's Angela Rayner and Jeremy Corbyn and Francis O'Grady. But I, 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 I was, and then somebody gave him a jar of a Dorset blackcurrant jam or something, that's what's in his hand. And, but I mean, I, I've got a lot of time for Corbyn, I think he's had a, a talk about brickbats being thrown at someone, I've never known, and I have met him and said, how do you cope with it, day after day, you know, but anyway, he's still there. <laughs> <laughs> I think that three is that three left. Thank you. <laughs> now I was really proud to make this because this is the staff who work in the National Gallery and all the gallery, you know, the the publicly owned galleries in Britain. And I was so proud to make it, and they. Um, you know, it's the sort of thing that gives me a real buzz, you know, when you, you meet groups of people like that and um, work with them. And I mean, what, one thing they were campaigning, they were campaigning for at that time was the seats, because the management had taken all the seats and chairs out of the galleries. And if you have to stand up for eight hours, you actually need to sit down. Oh, for the, the staff? The yeah, the, the, yeah, the gallery yeah. staff. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Get near. Um, And then, right, this is a series of slides. I just want to sort of go on, I hope, sort of treading on the two speak, other speakers' toes. I, I think this is that when Napoleon became settled as Emperor of France, he got two architects um, to Persier and Fontaine to, to design the Empire style, and that included women's dresses, throne rooms, decorations, everything and the Rococo swags and um, Jacquard, he promoted Jacquard, he was a French um, weaver. And my, my research, I don't know how you, you know, everyone else feels, but I think when Tutil and others began to make silk woven banners, they just lifted the empire style. And that, that's, and because it, it suited them politically and it, it, it you know, it had a resonance and a beauty about it. That, that, that's what I think happened. And I know um, John Gorman's book said it, you know, came from different sources, but I, I think it came from the French Empire style. And, the, and the, when you think about it, in, in Europe at the time, everyone was wearing a French Empire style. Every interior was, it was such a powerful influence. Um, you know, it was very pervasive. But anyway, what I want to say about this, I made this banner for Islington Trades Council, and if you could hold it in your memory, I'd be very grateful. <laughs> Can I just ask a question then? Yeah. Um, I noticed the advertising in the bottom right. Yes. How do you feel about that? 
Well, I, I personally, obviously this firm of solicitors paid for the bank. Yeah. <laughs> now, I personally have no problems, well, I don't have a problem with it, if yeah. they're a legitimate organisation. I, I, when I make balance, people often ask to see my tax return, because the main thing they want to make sure is that I'm paying income tax. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, trade unions, and, and, and I never get paid in cash. You know, and so if they pay tax and they're a legitimate company, uh, I don't, I don't feel funny about it. And a good Swiss Yeah, yeah, hopefully not as good as Jim and Miller, but um, <laughs> <laughs> I, you know. Do you not feel that you prefer to have money back? Possibly. Yeah. 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 The Tom Puddle martyrs were deported to, or um, they were transported to Australia, and the, there was a huge demonstration in London, in Islington, Copenhagen Fields, and they built a brand new camp. The building was, you know, not that far from this similar sort of building, and they were having a competition to decorate the cafe, and they asked me to submit designs. So I had, this is my design, this is a, this is a story of self-pity, really, but anyway, <laughs> the, that was the, the, that was the, I had it, the, there was a door there, we, we raised the, 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 George Levelus made this statement to the court, we raised the watchword liberty, they were the tall puddle martyrs, and these were the modern day people celebrating them, so that was my design. Mm -hmm. Now, when, I, when it came out, I unfortunately didn't win this competition. That was the winner, which was fantastic. But what made, but as, I, as I sort of went home on the tube, I, I realised that my banner was the centrepiece of it. <laughs> so so that, that, that sort of made me double think of it. Without the solicitor's logo, though. <laughs> And then the last one. What did you do about that? No, no. <laughs> yeah. But this is, for me, the biggest, I know that's Christmas Day, but for me, the biggest day of the year is Toll Puddle. And it's just like an open air exhibition. I mean, it's just, and it's always blazingly hot. And it's just, it's just incredible. And you, Neat people and wonderful people, and they can all be heroes. I mean, you no, know, the great beliefs of trade unionism and the left and socialism. People can live all that for one day. Maybe they have to go back to their lives afterwards. But, you know. I'm going to point out something really interesting. Come on. Our van is just behind you. Hooray! Yeah. <laughs> because whenever there's yeah. big demonstrations, there's always some of ours and some of theirs, and it's lovely yes. to see how they're working together because we have yes. such different styles. Yes, yes. And they each have sort of their own independent mm -hmm. impacts, and yes. I just think it's fantastic when you see all of these different mm -hmm. yeah. ones together. Yes. Great. But that's, yeah, that's me. But thank you ever so much. Thank you.